Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Peart, and welcome back to the Salty Science Podcast. Before we begin, I just want to say a quick good eye, mate, to Australia, because I was just notified by Anchor.fm, the platform that I use for this podcast, that we have Aussies listening. Woohoo! And I personally find this super exciting because I actually used to live on the Gold Coast in Queensland, and now I'm going to have to do a special episode on Australia. Ooh, that'll be fun. Okay, so anyway, so just as a quick recap, in the last two episodes we discussed the sun and solar radiation. And just to remind you, the sun is a star made up of mostly hydrogen and helium atoms. And because the sun is so large, there is a massive amount of pressure at its core. And that pressure squeezes four hydrogen atoms together to form one helium atom in a process called nuclear fusion. And when this happens, a huge amount of energy is released in the form of electromagnetic radiation. And while the sun emits a full spectrum of wavelengths similar to a black body, it mostly emits UV, visible, and infrared wavelengths. And in the last episode, we discussed how Planck's law and Wien's displacement law helps us to relate the sun's spectral density to the sun's temperature, and also why our sun appears yellowish-white versus other stars appear blue when they're hotter and red when they're cooler. And then finally, we also discussed how the Stefan-Boltzmann law related the temperature of an object, say like the sun, to the power or energy emitted per time. And if you're a new listener, well first, welcome. And second, I highly recommend that you go back and listen to episodes 3 and 4 because we're now going to use that information to jump straight into this week's episode topic, which is sea surface temperatures. Yay! And just a quick side note, in this week's episode, we'll be discussing surface temperatures. And in next week's episode, we'll be discussing temperature vertical profiles or temperature with depth. So this week, just the surface. Next week, we'll start talking about temperature as we go deeper and deeper with depth in the ocean. But for now, we're just going to be looking at the surface temperatures. Okay, so let's start out by looking at sea surface temperature distributions. And if you Google sea surface temperatures, you'll be guided to some excellent resources from NOAA, NASA, and Rutgers University. Actually, if you're in my area of the world and do a Google search, these are the resources that pop up. But hmm, Australia, what resources pop up when you do a Google search or use another search engine? So just so we're all on the same page here, I will be posting the links that I'm referencing on the Salty Science Patreon and Weebly pages. So make sure to check them out. And if you look at the global sea surface temperature map I've posted, you'll notice something kind of obvious. Water towards the poles is colder than water at the equator. So what's happening here? And this is where it all comes back to the sun, because the sun is the main source of energy contributing to these trends in temperature. But before we move on, let's go over a couple terms and definitions, because in science, as well as in life, it's always important to define your terms. So first, let's look at the definition of temperature. Again, if you type, what is temperature in Google, the online definition says that temperature is the degree or intensity of heat present in a substance or object, especially as expressed according to a comparative scale and shown by a thermometer or perceived by touch. And dictionary.com says that temperature is a measure of warmth or coldness of an object or substance with reference to some standard value. But in science, we also define temperature, sometimes also referred to as thermodynamic temperature, as a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a system. And kinetic energy is energy which a body possesses by virtue of being in motion. And so the more kinetic energy, the more particles or molecules move, which means it has a higher temperature. And if you'll remember from episode 3, absolute zero, or zero Kelvin, which is about negative 273 degrees Celsius, or roughly negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit is the point where molecules actually stop moving. So any temperature, regardless of how cold it may feel, if it's above zero Kelvin, the molecules have some sort of motion, and the faster the particles move or vibrate, the warmer the temperature of the object. And so how do we get molecules to move faster or to increase in temperature? Well, the answer is you have to add heat. So now let's quickly look at the definition of heat. Just like with temperature, most of us use the word heat to describe something that feels warm. And we could say that something with more heat feels hot or hotter and something with less heat feels cold or cooler. But in science, we define heat as a flow of energy or the transfer of energy from one system to another. 
And because it's a form of energy, that means that it's measured in units of joules in the International System of Units. And the standard unit for the rate of heat transferred is the watt, which we also discussed in episodes 3 and 4. And a watt is defined as one joule per second. And FYI, there are other units that are used to refer to heat. And you may have heard of units such as the British Thermal Unit or the Calorie, which also reference heat transfer. But for the purposes of this episode, we'll define heat in the terms of joules or watts. Which brings me back to a super important note. In science, it's always important to define your terms. And I'll give credit to Dr. David Johnson at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science for drilling this into my head. And I'll also encourage you as well, always define your terms. Okay, so getting back to heat. Heat is a form of energy transfer. And so to raise the temperature of an object or a body of water like the ocean, there needs to be some sort of input of energy. So now let's look at the ocean once again. While the ocean receives some heat energy from hydrothermal vents, underwater volcanoes, and other exposures to heat from the Earth's core, and some heat is transferred to the ocean directly from the atmosphere, the majority of the energy responsible for exciting water molecules enough to raise the ocean's temperature comes from the sun. So as you'll recall, the sun emits energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation, mostly in the form of UV, visible, and infrared wavelengths. And this energy, when it travels through our atmosphere and makes its way to our ocean, and most of the sun's energy is absorbed in only the top few meters of the ocean, which then that energy gets transformed into heat energy. And here's something fun to say about water as well as the ocean that I did make reference to in episode one. Water has a super high specific heat and heat capacity, which basically means that it needs to absorb a lot of energy before it'll actually increase in temperature or heat up. And similarly, it would need to lose a lot of energy before it would actually cool down. And water has the highest specific heat capacity of any liquid. And as you'll also recall from episode one, we talked about salt's impact on water's heat capacity and how the saltier the water, the lower the heat capacity. However, while sea water does have a lower specific heat capacity than say fresh water, water in general still has a relatively high specific heat capacity. And so when it comes to the ocean and to other aquatic habitats, having a high specific heat or heat capacity means that there is a resistance to sudden temperature changes, meaning marine organisms don't have to endure crazy temperature fluctuations, which is a good thing for them. And so for instance, if we were to compare land versus ocean temperature ranges, one of the highest temperatures recorded on land was in Libya, which reached 58 degrees Celsius or 136.4 degrees Fahrenheit and one of the lowest temperatures recorded was in Siberia where temperatures reached negative 68 degrees Celsius or negative 90.4 degrees Fahrenheit and so that's a temperature range of 126 degrees versus the temperature range of the ocean is only about 40 degrees from its highest to its lowest temperatures and just as another comparison if you've ever had the opportunity to spend the whole day at the beach say in the middle of summer, you may have noticed that in the early hours, the sand is relatively cool and you don't necessarily need to wear your flip-flops or sandals to walk comfortably on the beach. And as you stroll along the beach and you dip your feet in the water, you notice that the water is also cool. And then as the day progresses and the sun is a little higher and higher, higher up in the sky, and you decide to take another little stroll along the sandy beach, you realize very quickly that your feet are on fire because the sand is super hot. And so you have to rush to the water to cool cool off your feet. Well, this right here all boils down to the fact that the specific heat capacity of water is about five times higher than the sand. So a sandy beach will heat up faster than the water, and the reverse is also true. So basically what it means is that a sandy beach, the sand will heat up way faster than the water will. And that's why your feet will be on fire during the middle of the day, but the water will still feel cool. And the reverse is true too. If you've been at the beach at night, you may have also noticed that for the most part, the sand feels colder and the water feels warmer. And that's because the sand will also lose heat faster than water. And of course, we'll be reviewing this concept again in future episodes. But okay, so let's jump back to the sun really quickly. In episode 4, I mentioned that the Earth at the top of our atmosphere receives on average for the whole planet a about 340 to 342 watts per square meter. And of this radiation energy, about 30% is reflected immediately back into space. And so only 70% actually penetrates our atmosphere. And then of that 70%, some of it is automatically absorbed in the atmosphere. So only a smaller portion actually reaches the Earth's surface. And that portion we call insulation. And of the insulation, some of that is also reflected back from the Earth's surface, which we refer to as 
the surface's albedo. And you can think of albedo like this. If you've ever seen snow and ice on a sunny day, they appear shiny because they're reflecting a lot of insulation. And so therefore, snow and ice have a high albedo. So albedo kind of refers to just how, how reflective a surface is. And the ocean also has an albedo, but it can vary depending on conditions. And so if you've ever been at the beach and you see a lot of ripples or waves, that basically means that it has a higher albedo. And therefore, it means that more energy is being reflected back into the atmosphere. Versus if you've ever been at the beach on a calm day or a day when the water looks like glass, that's a day when the, when the ocean has a low albedo, which means that it's absorbing more energy than it's reflecting, which then also means that those water molecules are being provided with more energy, which at some point will increase their kinetic energy or in other words, increase their temperature, which then now I'd like to make another important point. The intensity or amount of insulation depends primarily on the angle at which the sun's rays strike the surface. And we'll definitely get into this in more detail in future episodes, but for now you can think of it like this. If you take a flashlight and shine it on a basketball or say a soccer ball or another type of circular sphere, if you shine it directly at the center of the ball, the circle of light is smaller than if you shine it towards the top or bottom of the ball. And in fact, the circle of light from the flashlight kind of looks stretched as you shine it towards the top or the bottom of the ball. So now if you imagine that the ball is the earth and your flashlight is the sun, the same concept applies. And from sea surface temperature maps, like the one I posted on the Salty Science Patreon and Weebly pages, we can relate insulation to temperature. And in the map, we can see that the surface water temperatures are higher near the equator and lower latitudes versus they're colder the closer you move towards the poles. And so from looking at these temperatures, we can also denote that there is a higher intensity of insulation near the equator and less towards the poles. And of course, we can't forget that the Earth is tilted and orbits around the sun. So the so insulation will be dependent on what time of year and even what time of day. So at the equator, but for the most part, insulation does remain high in the equatorial regions all year long versus the temperate regions will receive their maximum and minimum insulation during their respective summers and winters. And then the poles only receive insulation for about half of the year, which are completely illuminated during the summer and completely dark during the winter. And just as an FYI, it's because of satellites with mounted infrared sensors that we're able to measure changes in sea surface temperatures on a global scale, both seasonally and from year to year. And I've also posted a link to a NASA webpage that has a time-lapse video of global sea surface temperatures, which is just really cool. So I highly recommend that you check it out. And of course, our technology is getting better and better. So we're able to get better and better resolution of these images. Okay, so now let's ask the question, why do marine scientists care about the surface temperatures of the ocean? Well, sea surface temperatures have a large influence on climate and weather. For instance, have you ever heard of a thing called El Niño in La Niña? Or combined, we call it ENSO? If you haven't, don't worry, we'll have a full episode on this topic because it's super important. But basically, ENSO is a phenomenon where the air pressure and wind direction and surface temperatures all change around the Pacific Ocean along the equator. And one of the methods that we can use to monitor and study this phenomenon is by looking at sea surface temperatures. And like I said, ENSO has a huge global impact because it changes rainfall patterns all around the world. And I am currently living in Virginia, and even my part of the world feels the impact of an El Nino versus a La Nina year. And El Nino years have also been known to cause heavy rainfall in the southern United States, as well as severe droughts in Australia, Indonesia, and southern Asia. So it's kind of important. And then on a smaller scale, ocean surface temperatures also have an impact on the development of tropical cyclones, such as hurricanes and typhoons. And even while I'm recording this, Hurricane Dorian is making its way up the east coast of the United States and should be reaching my area of Virginia when this episode airs on Fun Science Friday. But hurricanes like Dorian draw their energy from warm ocean waters to form and intensify. But then as they move to colder water, they'll start to lose that energy and eventually disintegrate. And FYI, if you're not in a region that gets hit by hurricanes or typhoons, those of us that do will dread the thought of a slow moving hurricane in tropical regions because the longer it hangs out at sea, there is more potential for it to gain more and more energy, which basically means that when it hits land, it's going to be a wrecking ball. So in the grander scheme of things, it's better to have a hurricane that travels fast because it won't have the opportunity to gain as much energy. 
me personally with Dorian, I'm hoping Dorian will just decide to move back out to sea and up into colder water. But more on hurricanes later. And I just want to say quickly that my thoughts and prayers are for everyone who has been impacted by Dorian. And if you're in a region that's getting hit by Dorian, please be smart, safe, and evacuate if you need to. Okay, so now as I close this episode, which I really don't want to because I'm just having so much fun. I do have to get back to the lab now, which is also fun. But anyway, so I'll close this episode by leaving you with my listener's challenge, which is to answer the question, why should we care? So why should we care about sea surface temperatures? I think I gave you a really good hint by talking about Dorian, but there are other good reasons as well, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. And also, I do want to say a big thank you to everyone who has already submitted their listener challenge answers. They're great and very insightful, and I can't wait for our special listeners episode where I'll read out your answers. And also, I'll just throw it out there. If you have an awesome or adventurous ocean story or a story about your favorite time at the beach, if you want to share, feel free to include it in your email. And I might just pick a few to include in the listener's episode, which will air Friday, November 1st. And finally, last little bit of business. I know that I said in previous episodes that you could get your answers or now stories to me by Wednesday, October 30th, but my special guest needed to reschedule with me. So now the deadline for submissions for this first listener's episode will be Friday, October 25th. So don't forget to email me your answers at saltysciencepodcast at gmail.com. And also, if you don't feel like typing your answers, you can always send me an audio clip of you telling me your answers or sharing your story. That'd be really cool too. So until next week, don't forget to reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse, and to always stay salty. Thank you for listening to Salty Science. But guess what? You don't have to let the fun end here. Go to www.saltysciencepodcast.weebly.com where I've posted some cool videos, my study notes, and some really neat experiments that you can try at home. And if you want to follow along with my own research, you can follow me on Instagram, user handle Teps Adventure. That's T-E-P-S Adventure. All Salty Science episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, and YouTube, plus a number of other podcasting apps. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes as this is the best way to spread the word about this podcast. Salty Science is listener supported, so if you would like to show your support, visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash salty science, where you can either make a one-time donation of any amount or join the Salty Science crew for as little as a dollar a month. So visit the Salty Science Patreon and sign up today.